What is up? What is up? You are listening to Locked On NBA Draft. This is your host, Rafael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies. Got a special guest today, Steve Peltier from PistonPowered.com. And he had an interesting take that I saw on Twitter. I want to say it was a few weeks back. I had to reach out to him and see if he would be a guest on the show and kind of expound on his take. And Steve, what is going on? Not much. Just happy to be on this program and definitely love your work and happy to be here. The main reason why I have you on the podcast today uh-huh. is because you are a big Scotty Barnes fan. Oh, yeah. And in the article I saw, and I, it was a couple of weeks ago when I when I read it, but you wanted to make a case for the Pistons selecting Scotty Barnes in the top five. At now, three, I think really, yeah, three is where I would have him on my big board, to be honest. Not to cut you off, sorry. Yeah, so you're saying if the Pistons had the third pick in the draft, and let's just say it was Houston and um, I don't know who would be number two off the top of my head, Houston and, or let's say Orlando, and you would go with Scotty Barnes at number three. I would, yeah. So, all right, give me the main reason why you have Scotty Barnes ahead of, you know, you like your Jalen Greens or your Kum- uh-huh. Kuminga, uh-huh. maybe Mobley or Suggs, because for the most part, I've seen the top five has been pretty consistent. Yeah. From Cunningham to Mobley to Suggs to Green to uh-huh. Kuminga. Uh-huh. And I've seen Barnes probably safe to say he's number six on the majority of the, the big board. But you yeah. have him at number three. Oh, yeah. So before you get into that, who are your number one and number two? Well, it's Cade and Mobley. To me, like Cade does everything well. Even when he has a bad game, like he was doing weak side rim protection. He was playing like this weird power forward spot sometimes on defense. I mean, and you, you've made the case of him being the best shooter in the draft with all his off the dribble stuff. Like he just does everything well. Um, one of those rare guys that like even when the stat line doesn't look good you put on the film and you're like oh he's covering up for like three guys on defense right. and like the defense is still giving him like triple coverage and Mobley I was kind of down on Mobley for a minute when Kuminga started debuting and it looked like he was going to be better than expected but then the NCAA tournament happened and it was like oh okay his defense is like definitely impactful and his passing is just rare for a big too yeah creates a lot of opportunities and and the Bosch comparison I mean you can't you can't go wrong with a Chris Bosch like and he might even have some more ball handling in him yep so that's fair so now Jalen Green is um, I guess the people's favorite like I've seen a lot of people have him no lower than four yeah some people have number two and I I read that I could be wrong, but I want to say I read him say or make the comment that if he would have went to college, he would have been the number one pick. Uh So why, in your opinion, is Scotty Barnes a better fit for Detroit than Jalen Green? So Jalen Green, like I, he's one of those ones that I know is going to like, I would place money that he would score 20 points per game, like pretty consistently throughout his career. But he reminds me a lot of somewhere between Zach Levine and Bradley Beal. And, like, even Bradley Beal at his highest, right, last year without Russ, like, that team did not make the playoffs, right? And it it just seems like there's this undersized guard type um, prototype that if you're not making a high-level impact on both sides of the ball, I'm not sure the ceiling on it. He's going to score a lot of points. But, like, how much is he going to give up on the other end? And the creating for others, I thought he might be, like, a little bit like Cam Thomas coming into the year. But he ended up being a lot more than that, able to operate out of the pick and roll um, and stuff. So I think that's kind of the the sway on it. But my thing, being a Detroit Piston fan, I mean, defense is, is one of the main things I look for. And I'm just uncertain, like, how good Jalen Green could be on defense because he's what, like 6'4", maybe 180 pounds. So -hmm. even if he locked in on defense, he's a one, maybe two position defender, right? And if he gets switched on to three, four, fives, it's like just maybe count that bucket already. So that's his limitation there too. And part of the, like I said, creating for others, it's just hard to know 
that's one of those things that like i know you and your brother have that what um only so long fake point cards can pretend right yeah <laughs> yeah that's like one of those things that it's just hard to, to know if they're not like a jason kid or a Suggs in this draft where you've put on the film you're like oh yeah he's like passing guys open he sees it before even his teammate does um green's not quite there yet and maybe he will get to it but for me it's one of those things that it's it's hard to like just say yeah for sure he's gonna do it so would you say scotty barnes and jalen green are like total opposites as far as say on with scotty barnes the offense is the question the scoring but the defense is what everyone is as of right now you're banking on him being able to come in and contribute right away on the defensive end yeah jalen green everyone knows or expects him to be able to come in and score right away but can he defend will he be able to be a good defender even at his prime because of his size so so yeah. you're you're basically saying because you're from Detroit or or you're a Pistons fan and yeah, yeah. and the defense has kind of like been the um what's the word I'm looking for I guess it's been the trademark or mm-hmm. the it's been the main thing out of the Pistons when they've been successful is defense so you're going with the defensive upside. Yeah, a little bit. And I know my opinion in Piston fandom, if you go on Twitter, is not probably shared with a lot of people because there are a lot of Jalen Green supporters. I don't know right. if you know about James Edward III and yep. Nicholas Hinkle's Bun and Cardigan show. Like they're, I know Hinkle's a pretty big Jalen Green guy. And I, I get it. Like we want to see points put up and we need a lead scorer in Detroit. But uh, to me, Barnes is, the, the word I like to use is anomaly. Like there are a lot of things when you look at the numbers that say like, oh, this is a big dude who's putting up numbers that like you don't see from a player of his caliber and his size. All right. Once again, this is Raphael with NBA Draft Junkies on the Locked On NBA Draft podcast. I have my guest, Steve. Oh, man, I'm a butcher this last name. <laughs> I said it earlier, but he is from PistonPowered.com. And he is a big supporter of Scotty Barnes going number three to the Pistons. And that is, of course, if that's how the lottery shakes out. So I wanted to talk to you about Scotty Barnes' offense. All right. That's the big question right. mark. Yeah. Um, I've I've had a chance to watch him play live. I saw him at the under 19. And I, I remember just going back and looking at my notes. And this was from almost two years ago. Time has gone by fast. And one of the things that I, I wrote about him was he looks like he's really having fun. He kind of has this enthusiasm that you that you love. And, I mean, he carries it with him every game. He's versatile. I didn't know that he could play point like he played this season. I knew that he was a, a pretty good decision maker. I knew that he had some ball handling skills. I knew that there were some, I guess, Draymond Green type potential in him but like I said I didn't know that he was could be a full-time point guard especially on the, on the college level so with that being his his greatest asset on the offensive end where do you see his upside on the offensive end of the floor like what is his best case scenario and even like his basement well, I think his basement is somewhere like a bam out of bio type role not saying he's going to be like that same high level all defense all the kind but somebody who can defend all five positions and bam's not really a, a rim protector like we think of he's mainly like hey go out there and like just be a wrecking ball and mess up the other team's offense right like switch on the guys just get in their face and just stick to them the whole time i think he can do those same things like he was uh, Barnes, excuse me, pronouns, pal. Uh, Barnes was deployed as a um, on-ball, full-court defender on the primary ball handler for a lot of the year. And you can look up film like against Indiana, Wake Forest, Louisville, Virginia. He was like the minute the point guard or the primary ball handler got the ball, he was there. And it wasn't just like, you know, the last five minutes of the game. But Indiana is probably the best 
indicator of that because he starts it at like a minute and a half into the game and that game went into overtime too when he hit the game winning shot so I think the floor is that like a five level defender that you just throw in and messes up everything else there are also indicators that his shot is not as broken quote unquote as some people have said it would be so his free throw percentage was 62.1 percent on the year and his three-point percentage was 27.5 both look pretty bad right but um the first 12 games for his free throw percentage he, he shot 51.4 percent so those first 12 games it was like you know okay the scouting reports right this guy can't shoot it it's terrible but then in his final 12 games he shot 75.9 percent so he really like got in a better rhythm as the year went on you know a lot of people talk about shooters needing to find a rhythm and I don't, I don't really know his uh, background before college, um, but I do know like the MO on him coming into the year was like, he doesn't shoot threes. He's not a three point shooter or a shooter at all. So it seems like something he's still learning along the way. His three point percentage, there's also a teeny tiny bit of, of more of an indicator in that his first eight games, he shot 26.3%, you know, that's, you know, obviously terrible. But then the next 13 games there before the NCAA tournament or before his final three games, he shot 33.3%. So that's not, you know, amazing by any stretch of the imagination, but it's at least an indicator that like as the year went on, he started to get a little bit more comfortable with it. And he, he wasn't turning down threes the way like a Isaac Okoro or like Ben Simmons were. I think he at least recognizes like, oh, I'm in the corner. They passed me the ball. I, I need to shoot it here. Um, so I think there are those other indicators. But the main upside with him is is at the rim, where he shot 70.6%, which is really good. It's like what you want your, you know, high-level center to shoot. There were only a couple guys in college basketball that shot better at the rim, one being Evan Mobley, another being Franz Wagner, another is Charles Bassey um, that, that had that. So he finished. And that wasn't like a small part of his offense either. That was 45% of his offense. Mm -hmm. And this is like in transition as a pick and roll ball uh, handler. And I mean, he's 6'9", 227. Who wants to get in the way of, of that guy when he's got the ball in his hands or when he's running down the court? I think that's the main offensive thing. I'm not saying he's going to be Giannis, so please nobody say that, that this is going to happen. But I mean, the way the Bucks developed him, they were just like, hey, we know you can handle the ball. We know like you're pretty athletic. Like here, let's just roll it out there and like you do your thing and we'll like let you kind of, of do it. And I feel like whoever drafts Barnes needs to have that role too. We're like, we're going to give you the ball. We're going to let you handle it. We're not just going to park you in the corner and we're going to develop these on ball skills to where you can finish and then develop everything outside of that. Similar to the way Giannis's development became. I think that's his ceiling. Again, I'm not saying he's Giannis, my comp for him. And this is going to go way back because um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I was born in 1984. So this is before my time, but my mom played point guard growing up. You know, I'm native, res ball is a big thing. And like the teachers that I had kind of taught me the older school ones of like the 70s at ABA All-Stars. So my comp for him is Larry Keenan, who was a power forward for the Spurs in like the 70s mainly. And if you don't know who that is, go look him up on YouTube right now. He was 6'9", 205. He was like the secondary creator and the secondary scorer to the Iceman, uh, the legend George Gervin, and James Silas was also on those teams. And if you watch them, Keenan mainly like got out in the break and it was like everybody just cleared out of his way because he could, you know, throw it down on people and nobody wanted to be that, that poster. He also was a really good passer. Um, at that time as well too he was mainly like passing out of the post but he when you see his transition stuff he was also finding his open teammates when the lanes were clogged up uh, i see barnes in that similar role of like he might not be that Giannis like primary scorer but i think he'll be like this to where keenan in his best years was like you know 20 points three assists and like eight rebounds so i think that would be my bet on barnes is to be something like a larry keenan that is a name I have not heard in a long time. <laughs> I think that's definitely going to go over the heads of a lot of listeners. Now, yeah. other than Giannis and, and Bam, and I'm a Blazers fan, so 
whenever someone mentions Bam, I just kind of get this punch in my gut because <laughs> the Blazers selected Zach Collins yeah, over yeah. Bam. Yeah. And I feel like Bam would basically plug a lot of the holes in the Blazers roster as far as giving us I, I'm saying us. I mean, I don't play for the team, but sometimes the fan in me. That <laughs> <right>. <laughs> but yeah, I, I feel like a band would, would address a lot of the needs on the Blazers roster as far as a swishy defender. He would improve the overall athleticism of the front line. And I mean, the Blazers are playing a lot of drop coverage. And I, I feel like we might have the least athletic front line in the NBA. <laughs> no vertical live threats. I mean, Nurk is a pretty... Yeah. You know, he's pretty agile, but as far as just, like, switching out and, yeah, yeah I mean, I just think Bam would be – I think the Blazers could be a contender in the West if they had Bam as opposed to Nurk. Because even you can play Bam, like, at the four because, you know, like, a lot of people assume Bam is a center. But last year, I want to say Myers, Leonard, and Bam started a large yeah. percentage of the game, if not the majority – of the games together so so yeah so if you're comparing scotty barnes to bam on the defensive end then i mean that that that's a good comparison especially with with the versatility so my my next question about that is do you think scotty could play small ball five or would you start him at the five I think he could, but I would honestly want him to be in more of like somewhere between a, a point guard to a small forward, somewhere in the one to three, just because when you have a ball handler that size, it's just like, what do you do, right? You know, to put your your Blazers into perspective. I love Damian Lillard. He's my favorite non-piston, but like if Lillard has to be lined straight up against like a, a Barnes, you know, they're going to have to move Covington to him, right? And yeah. then, like, how does the rest of that team, like, defend everybody else? So I, I would I would want him to be that. But I I see a, a place where he could, like, on the Pistons, which is partially why I, I um, argue for him. I mean, the team is in such a, like, we just need talent acquisition phase, too. But if they wanted to roll out, like, Killian Hayes, uh, Hamadou Diallo, Sadiq Bey, Jeremy Grant, and then Barnes at the five, like he would be able to be that secondary creator to Killian, help open up some like catch and shoot opportunities for him as well, continue to let Diallo like develop as a shooter as well. So he's not having to just be on the ball so much. And then Grant and Sadiq would just be like easy money from the corners, right? And you could find Grant on lobs and on pick and roll, like him and Grant as a four or five pick and roll, that would be, you know, pretty awesome to see. Yeah, that leads somewhat into my next question but we'll, we'll cover that on the next segment all right once again it's Rafael with nba draft junkies and steve now you kind of mentioned it earlier but this is the question i've been saving for the last segment and it right. is how do you feel about scotty barnes fit with the Pistons based off their roster as it's constructed today. You kind of hinted at it a little bit earlier, uh -huh. but give me your best case scenario for him with the Pistons roster. I think his best case scenario would be like as their primary or secondary ball handler. But I, I think part of it fit with Pistons. Like I, I, I think honestly, I'm going to be like, I'm going to keep it real. I'm a little like iffy on his fit. But I feel that way with a bunch of the players on the team already. Like, I'm not sure if they want to continue to develop Isaiah Stewart at the four or the five, because sometimes he's shooting three, sometimes he's not. Um, Hamadou Diallo, I'm not sure if they're going to re-sign. Sometimes he was like, his shooting looked better as a piston. It was something around like 39%, but like that's obviously an anomaly as well. It's not like consistent with what he is. So is that going to be continuing what he is because he looked like better as a ball handler in Oklahoma City. He was developing that and dishing out more assists. Um, Killian Hayes is shooting and offense in general is, you know, developing still. He's still trying to get healthy as before well. You, before you go any further, yeah, I was such a big Killian Hayes fan at this time <laughs> last year. Yeah. Uh -huh. I made the case to say he's better than LaMelo. I know it's just year one of hopefully 
10 to 15, but man, do I look bad with that? <laughs> with uh, no, that no, no, no. You, you, you don't look bad. So I was just writing fan posts for another Piston site at that time. And I didn't have LaMelo ranked for the, most of the year because wow. I watched his games and there would be times, you know, where he's just like wiping his shoes in the corner and stuff and not like carrying on defense. And I was like, man, is this guy like supposed to just turn it on in, in the NBA? So I did not. I the times thought he wasn't draftable. So I <laughs> had a terrible take on that one. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I like Killian. Like I said, he got injured and in, was it like the seventh game or something like that? I know. Even during those games, he didn't look good. He showed some flashes when he came back. I was actually sh- surprised that they brought him back, considering that Me they didn't too. have much to play for. Yeah. But I, I guess it was more so, you know, you kind of want to give him some confidence going into the offseason. And again, he showed some flashes, but he needs to be a lot more aggressive and assertive on the offensive end. And then, yeah. you know, the questions about his shooting – were there coming into the draft. I don't think he answered those questions yet. Oh. So, um, and so that's why I, I was curious to see how you would come, how you would fit Barnes and, and Killian. Cause I think on one hand, uh-huh. having the additional playmaker is always uh-huh. good. You know, you always oh, yeah. want to have multiple ball handlers and decision makers. And one of the things I liked most about Barnes is that he has a higher assist to turnover ratio than, quite a few of the guards that are projected to be lottery picks. I mean, not yeah. saying that he's a better decision maker than Cade, but Cade had a negative assist to turnover ratio while Scotty Barnes has, it was almost two to one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So yeah. I think that fit works out, but I wonder in like in the half court, especially their, their, especially next year. So like we'll be Barnes rookie year. Hayes, I, I, I guess you can make a case and say it would be his rookie year since he, they didn't play a lot of games. Yeah. And I mean, the Pistons aren't expected to do anything as far as winning next year anyway, mm-hmm. but I think that could be some pretty ugly offensive possessions <laughs> in the half court. If neither one of those guys make major strides as a, a floor spacer. Oh yeah. I know. Like, I know that's where I'll get roasted the most from Piston fan base. First and foremost, is just like, Oh, I guess you want like everybody to just clog the lane then. Right. And nobody's getting, buckets there but uh, yeah I think they're just in a the Pistons are in a spot where it's like we just need to find talent you know we just need to get whoever we think has like outlier skills and just figure it out there again going back to the Bucks comp with Giannis again I'm not saying he's Giannis but I think it's a similar trajectory because Jabari Parker was like the guy they were building around right Giannis was just kind of like oh this guy is you know he's showing flashes but oh we got number two pick we got Parker, you know, and as it went on, they just said, you know, we're just going to give the ball to whoever, you know, gives us the most success when they have it in their hands. And it turned out to be Giannis, you know, sadly for Jabari, he had injuries and other things. But I think that's a lesson like a lot of teams should learn from. It's just like, well, we're not certain on on one guy, but we got a high pick again. That doesn't mean we shouldn't just try to draft as much and whoever the most talented individual is i think they should just do that and see um what how that plays out too yep so do you think isaiah stewart is the center of the future uh i'm not sure i know a lot of you know pistons are high on beef stew but Mm -hmm. that's that's a great nickname have you seen the t-shirts by the way they made where it looks like the campbell's can it's pretty good no, I haven't. I haven't seen yeah, it. I have yeah. to see if I can pick up one next time I'm in Detroit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're pretty good. But I, I, I don't know. I'm uncertain because he showed a lot on defense, and like I said, occasionally they'll like let him shoot threes. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I like him a lot, but I'm not sure he'll be anything beyond like that six man energy guy. Um, that like you just when everybody's tired you throw in there and he like re-energizes everything else right i'm not sure how switch be in like a playoff setting too as well because his defensive film at washington wasn't that great but he you know like turn on the light in detroit and obviously us as a fan base like really gravitate toward him because of his hustle it's just athletically you know once you get into playoffs it's another level so 
that that's the point to where I'm like, yeah, I'm sure he'll stick around in Detroit a long time, but I don't know that he'll be able to be like, you know, a Eastern Conference final starter. Yeah. All right, last question. Let's say it is the roster as it's constructed today, along with Scotty Barnes, and you know, he's selected in the top five. What is your opening day starting lineup for the Detroit Pistons? If Barnes is selected? If Barnes is selected. It's probably Killian Barnes at one of those two to four spots. Sadiq, uh, Grant, and Stewart. Although I'm not sure if in free agency they'll go a different route with center or if Plumlee will be traded. Because I feel like Plumlee's probably the guy if they're going to trade somebody that will, just because he showed a lot more playmaking ability than I think a lot of people thought he had. Um, and his stock is a little bit up. Um, so, yeah, that, that would be the one swing on it. And the two guard, like the two guard, there's Gary Trent and there's like Lonzo Ball. But I feel like I'm not sure that, you know, they're going to be somebody that the Pistons will go. Not that I know anything or anything, but it just seems like they already have Hamadou Diallo. There's Frank Jackson, who they may or may not re-sign. It seems like there's guys already in the building that they would want to give those minutes to. So it's it's uh, uncertain. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know this. I said it was the last question. I have one more. But do you think that between Bay, Grant, and Barnes, do you think they're all of them their best position is at the four spot? No, I don't think so. I think Grant and um, Sadiq can, you know, switch off at the three and the four and play either one. I think Sadiq is more cerebral and like has a really high basketball IQ to be able to hang with guys as a three on defense. And his ball handling is, is getting better. He, so he was my number two guy last year. He, I was super high on Sadiq Bay, so I was Me very too. excited when the Pistons – I know. I remember I listening. Bay when, to Portland. <laughs> Bay to Portland. And he would have been perfect too. Yeah. yeah. So, But I think – and then Grant is obviously super athletic. I think he fits a little bit better at the four just because of that lob threat and his finishing ability is way better than Sadiq's is. Um, and Sadiq's still developing as a inside the arc player. He's mainly a three point shooter at this point. So I think, you know, he should be at the three and Barnes, like I said, on ball, I would keep him at that too. If I were in the Pistons to let, you know, Killian heal up a little bit more, let him develop his catch and shoot more. Cause he was doing that in his last season and uh, overseas, if I'm not mistaken, he was doing that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and that would add something to his game, too, to where he's not just trying to drive in all the time. He's not just trying to hit that floater. And he's not having to, you know, work on his right hand because that's what everybody's work screaming that, right. about, right? Yeah. yeah. So. All right. Well, man, I appreciate you coming on. Again, this is Rafael Barlow with NBA Draft Junkies and my guest, Steve Peltier. Did I say it right this time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it right. All right. In the second segment. Right when I was ready to say it, I was like, no, I think that's wrong. Even though I said it in the first segment, it just kind of escaped my mind. But you are a writer or a contributor on PistonPower.com. Yep. Where else can the listeners find your work? Because obviously you know your stuff. I mean, just listening to this podcast, uh -huh. it, it's been impressive with how well you follow your team, but only not only your team, but the, the NBA draft prospects, especially the guys who you want your team to draft. So where can the <laughs> listeners find, find your work at? Well, I mainly post there. So my other job is uh, writing in the academic world. Um, so I'm mainly just on pistonpower.com. They can also find stuff on my Twitter and my Instagram and both are Borke Worldwide. So I'm originally from Albuquerque. Um, Borke is B-U-R-Q-U-E Worldwide um, on both, again, Instagram and Twitter. And that's, if anybody saw the movie Step Brothers, that's kind of a, a play on their uh, prestige worldwide, if, if you remember that. So those are the main two spots uh, you can find me. But I definitely try and post an article once a week at um, Piston Powered. So I'll probably do two this week because I wasn't able to do one last week. But definitely want to do deep dives i'll start writing a little bit on like different groups of players i see and there'll be definitely one of those posts coming up this week all right sounds good now i have a better understanding of your name on instagram 
and your email address. Uh, I, was, I, I just couldn't figure it out. But now knowing that you're from Albuquerque, it makes a lot of sense to me. So, all right, man. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. This is Raphael, NBA Draft Junkies. It's locked on NBA Draft. Got my guy Steve Help TA from PistonsPower.com. And we are out.